Continuing on from the theme of prophecies that was mentioned in the previous episodes, where we talked about the spread of Islam in the Arabian Peninsula, and we also talked about the spread of Islam in the Levant region, the Roman Empire, and even to this extent, the Persian Empire as well. We're going to continue with that theme and the theme of prophecies, prophecies from the Quran and the Sunnah, where the Prophet Muhammad predicts something that's going to happen and it happens in terms of military conquest of a certain land. And we talked about how unlikely this is really, how unlikely this is considering the fact that Muslims were a small band of people being tortured in Mecca, as we recall from the first episode and from the second episode, that there were a small band of people being tortured and for example, Bilal ibn Rabah being tortured by uh, by some very oppressive individuals and him chanting, Ahadun Ahad. You know, God is one and only, God is one and only. And the Muslims were under siege at another point when they uh, when they had Medina under, under their control. And the trenches were dug around them and there were 10,000 people surrounding them. And how at that stage, the Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, would predict that Muslims would spread all the way through to the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. We've seen so far that those predictions have materialized incredibly, accurately, with so, with such detail. So in fact, we talked about some very unexpected details. But today we're going to be speaking about the spread of Islam in North Africa. In particular, we're going to be focusing on the spread of Islam in Egypt. And this is something else that the Prophet Muhammad in many places actually predicted. Um, sometimes he would use the word Misr, meaning Egypt. Um, but in the most authentic report that I could find, he mentions that that certainly you will conquer a, a, a land that Al Qirat, a currency called Al Qirat, is being used there or is being mentioned there even. And Nawawi, who is one of the scholars of Islam, the greatest scholars to ever have explained Sahih Muslim, explains that this land is Egypt. So we have corroborating evidences and we have evidences from the Prophet Muhammad that he himself said that Egypt would be conquered. The reality is Egypt was conquered and it was done so at the time of Amr ibn al-Khattab, a man who we discussed to some extent in the least in the last episode. His bravery, his fortitude, his determined attitude towards opening and conquering lands was something that even people like Michael Hart would mention in their books of most influential peoples of all time. But there was another man with very similar characteristics who would be a general of an army, someone called Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As, who was someone who was praised by the Prophet Muhammad himself, where the Prophet Muhammad said about him, Aslam al nasu wa amana Amr ibn al-As, that the people have become Muslim but Amr ibn al-As has become a believer. And at the time of Amr ibn al-Khattab, Amr ibn al-As said to him, I am one of the arrows of the arrows of Allah. And Asahm min siham al-Islam. I am one of the arrows of the arrows of Allah. So throw me wherever you want. Look at this, subhanAllah. Look at the willingness to engage with the greater Muslim with the greater Muslim and non-Muslim population and look at his dedication to Islam. Look at this man's dedication to Islam. Throw me wherever I want. Look at the bravery there. Throw me wherever you want. This is what he said to, uh, to Amr ibn al-Khattab. And Amr ibn al-As would be thrown right in the neck of the woods. He'd go straight to Egypt, a country which had been ruled by the Roman Empire for almost a thousand years, for about 900 years. Now you can imagine the grip that the Roman Empire had on this country. But a country which also had problems in terms of internal strife and problems relating to theology. As we've discussed in the last uh, episode, some of the Arab Christians and the Coptic Christians and the Christians in the Eastern Wing of the Roman Empire would be very much disillusioned with some of the rest of the church, especially because of the taxation of the, of the Catholic Church. And there were problems with, with that. So it was a bit of a double-edged sword, but also you could say that it explains a lot of the conversion that would happen thereafter. Amr ibn al-As marched with 4,000 people to Egypt. Now you can imagine, now when we say march to, to Egypt, it's not, you know, it's a big deal to march from somewhere 
like the Arabian Peninsula to Egypt, marching and going with you know your horses and and so on and so forth. You can imagine that's a very taxing journey. So he went all the way there, and when they got to to Egypt, Amr al Khattab, in fact, had spoken to some of his his shura members, if you like, the consultation members. And some people were saying, this is too big of a risk. I mean, Amr, you know, this is too big of a risk. You, you, you're sending this man with 4,000 people to, to a place like that. I mean, he's going to be outnumbered. It's, it's a place, in fact, they've never been to Egypt before. They don't even know what the geography is in Egypt. So how can you go to a place like Egypt and expect there to be no problems whatsoever? So Amr ibn Khattab sent a letter to Amr ibn Laas detailing that, look, if you've already gone there, you know, and if you're already there, then do what you need to do. But if you haven't gone there yet, you know, come back. Amr ibn Khattab sent that letter. And Amr ibn Laas, receiving that letter near the borders of Egypt, feared that potentially there would be something in it that he wouldn't like. And he had already made his mind. And this gives us a lesson. If you make your mind to do, if you make up your mind to do something in life, you know, just do it. Just make sure that you've done the precautionary, you've taken the precautionary steps. As the Quran says, وَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ If you have now made that decision, then have tawakkul, have reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll find that with military expeditions, the like of which we're describing now, and the like of which we discussed in the previous episode, tawakkul, reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is almost absolutely guaranteed. Because... At the end of the day, you're putting your life on the line for this for this cause. So they went, 4,000 soldiers. And at that time, they went to the capital of Egypt, which is Alexandria. And they lay siege on Alexandria, al And they lay siege on those parts of Egypt. And it was one of the biggest conquests and one of the most important, strategically important, historical conquests of all times. Of all times. And there was big tolerance that was shown from the Muslims to Christians and people of other faith. And this would be a springboard for other conquests that would take place in 61 and 62 AH, which was some 40 years after this, because this took place in about 20 AH. So we're talking good 40 years after this. That's when there would be more further conquests in the Maghreb type regions, you know, Libya and Morocco, current day Morocco and Algeria and so on. And Gibraltar and all those things that you may have heard of. Now, some of the misconceptions that arise in terms of these things relate to relate to the once again the the the, the discourse that says that you know Egypt was overtaken by these bar, you know barbaric Arabs, these you know bad people, these imperial Muslims, and so on and so forth. And in fact, I was quite uh, interested to find, looking at Sir, Wil uh, Sir Thomas Walker Arnold's book, who is an Orientalist. The first, the very first page, which I'm going to read, in fact, page 102 of the book, how he's actually quite honest about what happened in Egypt. He says, Islam was first introduced into Africa by the Arab army that invaded Egypt under the command of Amr ibn Laas in 640 AD. Three years later, the withdrawal of the Byzantine troops abandoned the vast Christian population into the hands of the Muslim conquerors. The rapid success of the Arab invaders was largely due to the welcome they received from the native Christians, who hated the Byzantine rule not only for its oppressive administration, but also and chiefly on account of the bitterness of theological rancor. The Jacobites, who formed the majority of the Christian population, had been very roughly handed by the Orthodox adherents of the court and subjected to the indignities that have not been forgotten by their children event, uh, even to the present day. Some were tortured and thrown into the sea. Many followed their patriarch into exile to escape from the hands of their persecutors, while a large number disguised their real opinions under a pretended acceptance of the Council of Council, uh, uh, Chalcedon. This is 451, by the way. To these cops, the Jacobite Christians of Egypt are called. The Mohammedan conquest brought a freedom of religious life such that they had not enjoyed for a century. On payment of the tribute, here the jizya is being referenced, Amr left them in undisturbed possession of their churches and guaranteed to them autonomy in all 
ecclesiastic matters, thus delivering them from the continual interference that had been so grievous a burden under the previous rule. The reality is, Islam brought to those Jacobite Christians who lived in Egypt at that time, something that they had never experienced before in terms of toleration. Something very new and something very, something very much beneficial to them. This would continue until a lot of those people became Muslim. At that time, so to, uh, Thomas Walker Arnold says 24,000 immediately became Muslim under one sway, then he provides some evidence for that, and others became Muslim thereafter. And you know, even if you go to Egypt now, you'll find that there's a Coptic community who are protected, who are numerous. There's a big number of Copts in Egypt at this point in time, which is a living testimony, a living, a living demographic testimony to the fact that Islam was tolerant to those individuals. So we talked about the expansion into Egypt. We talked about the fact that this was a springboard for what would happen afterwards into the 60s, 60 AH, some 40 years after this conquest. And even then, the trickle down effect in the 10th century to Western Africa, where West Africa would become become introduced to Islam and become Muslim, tribal leaders would become embrace Islam in present day countries like Nigeria and Ghana and so on and so forth, those West African countries. And they would become very prosperous, in fact. We're coming to a conclusion here that, in fact, wherever Islam is actually realized in countries, there's a high degree of toleration. And not only that, there is also a propensity for those countries to be economically prosperous, so long as they are in connection with the Quran and the Sunnah. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.